Hi, everybody. Um, it's five o'clock, so we want to make sure that uh, we start on time. And there's uh, folks who are still joining us. So um, welcome, everybody. This is the third of our UVA School of Architecture faculty lecture series. Um, my name is, I'm Kim Haggart. Uh, I'm the Director of Alumni Relations. And I have the pleasure of introducing Tim Beatley, our uh, Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Com Communities in our Urban and Environmental Planning Department. Uh, Tim is here to talk about biophilic cities and it's a, you know, I think it's a great conversation to be having at this moment when we are looking so much to being outside um, right now as a way to keep us sane and happy and breathing some fresh air during all of this. Um, a little rules as we have this webinar, uh, so you all know. This is a webinar uh, format, so therefore all of your videos and sound is automatically off. And um, if you have questions, because when Tim is done, we will open this up and we will um, ask him all the questions that you guys have. Try to make this as much of a discussion as we can. You can pull it up in your Q&A down on the bottom of your screen and type in your questions as they come to mind and we will go through it afterwards. I will help moderate those. Um, you can also uh, use the chat feature. Um, we'll try to monitor that as well. Um, and otherwise, that is where we are today. We're, we're oh, more people are joining and uh, definitely join us. Next week, we'll have Elgin Cleckley. Uh, the week after that, Peter Waldman. Uh, and the week after that is Matthew Jull. Um, so several more great faculty members coming every Wednesday. So with that, Tim, it's okay. all yours. Thank you for joining us. Very good. Thank, thanks, Kim. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the Monacan Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land and, and water uh, on which we sit, at least here in, in Charlottesville. Uh, thanks so much uh, for the chance to, to, to chat with you about biophilic cities. My goal is to speak for about 45 minutes um, and then we'll have a chance for question and answer and comments on, on what you're hearing. Um, I, I think it is timely to, to chat about the, the role of nature in our lives. And uh, just to begin it, with maybe the obvious, I, I am an urban planner, a, a city planner, thinking ab about how we design uh, cities, future cities, uh, certainly um, given what we're learning about the pandemic and, and, uh, and how we're adapting to these circumstances. Lots of insights, lots of questions about what cities will look like and how they will function in the, in the future. Um, we do, though, um, believe that they're going to be compact and dense. I mean, that's one of the questions. Will we still have this commitment to, to living in dense cities? And I think that we will, and we can certainly talk about that at, at the end. So we know if we're going to tackle climate change, we're going to um, address all of these sort of pressing questions, we've really got to invest, continue to invest in compactness and density, cities in which we can walk and bicycle and and cities that, that uh, have small carbon footprints. But at the same time, um, we want to be close to nature. And, and that's clear today, more so today than it might have been two or three months ago even. And so our key question in biophilic cities is, is often around, can we have that compactness and density, but also that connection to nature? And so that's really a key a question. It's not really a question so much. We're, we're very strongly arguing that we can have that density, that compactness, um, those low carbon cities at the same time that we have uh, nature rich or, or biophilic cities. So to start, um, just a little bit of background. We, we started looking at, at this idea of biophilia um, around 2010, uh, 2011. We had um, a little bit of uh, initial funding from the Summit Foundation in Washington and, and several uh, grants from them that followed. Um, and we're now at the end of a two-year Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant. And I'll, I'll tell you maybe a little bit more about that as we go along. But to study this, the, the creative ways in which cities were already incorporating nature and putting nature at, at the center. And it builds uh, essentially on this idea of biophilia. Here's a, a definition from, from E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at, at Harvard. This 
uh, idea that we are uh, that we carry with us our, our ancient brains. We have this innate connection, this uh, this need, inborn need to 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 affiliate or or to be near, to have nature around us. It's um, the idea that we are uh, happy, <coughs> happier, healthier, able to lead more meaningful lives when we have nature. And it's not just something that you can get <coughs> occasionally on a holiday once or twice a year. It has to be all around us. It has to be designed into the spaces where we're spending most of our time, where we're working, where, where we're living, and, and increasingly uh, in, in cities. So that's the, the crux of the, the argument. Nature is not something uh, optional. It's just absolutely essential, again, to, to leading a happy and healthy and meaningful life. And the evidence is pretty compelling, at least to me. And I think for most of us, again, especially given what we're experiencing um, as we're living with lockdown and, and stay at home um, orders, it's that, that nature, it's a saving grace, it's, it's a balm, it's um, an a, a affirmation of how important those connections to the natural world uh, are. And, and as this slide suggests, what is it that, that we're drawn to? And I think we could answer this, each of us, in our own ways. For me, it is that it, it living things, the birds and, and, and trees and flowers and the, the, the sight and sound of, of water, um, those things that we've co-evolved with. So it's only been a, a tiny little bit of our evolutionary history where, where we've been a bit removed uh, from, from nature. So it's not surprising that we, that we have such positive responses to the natural world. Um, my, my colleague, um, Steve Keller, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, uh, used to like to talk about biophilia um, as, as a, a tendency or as a um, genetic tendency that we needed that wasn't, it, it's with us, it's innate, but it requires strengthening, it requires uh, cultivating. Um, and I think that's really important and, and really an important role for, for cities. So, so this is an image actually from a film that we've made um, called Ocean Cities. It's a film about looking at cities, cities, coastal cities, cities on the edge of marine environments and the ways, the creative ways that they're uh, connecting residents to, to that marine world, that marine nature. And so we actually took a, a film crew into the water and, and followed these fifth graders and their, um, their assignment was actually to, to seek out marine um, organisms. And each pair of kids um, actually was given a, a little net. And so we tried to, to capture the magic of, of this experience. And they, the kids would scoop the bottom of the water, the, the um, bottom of the sea, essentially, this is the Atlantic Ocean, um, with the water coming up to the sort of their um, legs, their knees. And at one point, a child uh, pulled up a net that had what to me looked like a sort of oversized tennis ball, and it turned out to be a puffer fish. And the, the kids were just amazed by, by this and the other things that they were finding. And, and as that child put the, put the puffer fish back in the water, it returned to something more like a, a, something they recognized as a, as a fish. But it, it's a, um, a lesson that uh, we may we are living in very in, in environments that are very disconnected often from the nature around us, and it takes these kinds of opportunities and it, uh, these kinds of initiatives and programs that get kids out, and you can literally see that that innate connection with the natural world reappearing, um, and and so cultivating these innate tendencies is a big part of uh, what a biophilic city is all about. We could spend the whole time talking about the emerging evidence. It seems almost weekly uh, a new study that demonstrates the power of nature. This is one from a recent issue, issue of bioscience, uh, a study that shows the relationship between the greenness of a, a neighborhood, the greener it is, the less de evidence of depression, anxiety, and, and stress. Um, we, we have a lot of evidence about the power of, of nature, the power of a walk in nature. Um, the Japanese concept of forest bathing, many of you may know about that. Um, several decades of evidence that as, as you walk through a forest, at the end of that walk, 
your stress hormone levels go down, that, that walk helps to boost your immune system. The Japanese are so convinced about this that they, they set up a, a network of, of forest bathing stations. Um, so we know that power, the nature has this remarkable power, uh, positive power on us and for us. Um, we're still learning about the science. Um, one, of the, one of the key ideas is that because we've co-evolved with nature, that we're um, the, the fractals, the shapes and forms, those reoccurring shapes in, in nature are ones that we have evolved to, to see and process more easily. We've gotten to know um, this fellow, uh, Taylor from, um, uh, from uh, Richard Taylor from the University of Oregon uh, Physics Department, who talks about this in terms of fractal fluency. So we've, he believes we've, we've uh, developed a visual system that just more easily processes that those those shapes and forms from nature and fractal fractals in particular. So we get this amazing we have this amazing effortless looking as he as he describes it when we when we ponder a cloud or we look at the ocean or we watch a bird, uh, for example. And actually, the image on the left. Um, is about birds and bird song, and we have a lot of evidence now that we have these positive effects from from hearing bird song, and and hospitals in some places in the UK and elsewhere where they're they're recording bird song and then playing it back um, at particularly stressful times when when kids are going into surgery or having inoculations. So so there's so many ways that nature um, has this positive effect for us. I'm trying to summarize it all is very difficult. This is my uh, simple attempt to try to do it, to, to start to list all, all of the evidence, all the ways, all the outcomes associated with having more nature. And it is all of these things. It is associated with higher cognitive performance. Um, it affects our mood in a, in a positive way. It helps to calm us. All these things I think we know, and we maybe know even more so today, given the circumstances that, that we're in, um, but evidence that uh, we are more likely to be generous in the presence of nature, we're more likely to be cooperative, we're more uh, creative when we have nature um, around us. So uh, for us in the Bioflex Cities project, um, we often use the word flourishing as a way to sort of capture all of these things, all these positive values that come along with, uh, with nature. And so it's the, the cognitive performance and the positive in, impacts on mood, but it's also purpose and, and meaning and, and connection, connection to other forms of life and connection to other human beings. Um, I inserted this slide just to make the obvious point that we, in this pandemic, we are uh, rediscovering, many of us rediscovering the power of nature and the, the importance. It, it, it has an, an unusual importance in our lives, right? Image on the left from Forest Park um, in our partner city, Portland, Oregon, in Edmonton, Canada. On the right, this is a map from their regional, their wonderful uh, regional planning process called Breathe. Um, both sort of showing, I think that we're, we, we are looking around and hopefully appreciating uh, the ways in which those parks, small and large, and those uh, street trees and those small green spaces, uh, even a single tree that we might have a view of, uh, is delivering so much power and, and is so important to us, has a, a kind of stabilizing uh, and therapeutic value for us in these really stressful times. Um, we, of course, want more nature in cities because of all the, the, the ecological services provided, all the remarkable things that cities do for us. This is actually an image uh, from Rotterdam um, where they're installing green roofs and, and uh, creating new, new canals and, and uh, new uh, plazas that both serve to create green, uh, new civic space and green space, but also absorb and retain stormwater. So we like to say that uh, just about anything that you can do to make a city more biophilic will also make it more uh, resilient, something that we need even more today, thinking about climate change and, um, and those, those pressures cities are facing. I do like to describe the 
biophilic design and biophilic planning as um, a global movement. And it is gaining uh, traction. This is one little bit of evidence. Um, two summers ago, the, the Congress of the International Federation of Landscape Architects uh, held their conference, their World Congress in Singapore, and they chose biophilic cities as the theme uh, that year. And I think increasingly we're recognizing uh, the, uh, in cities around the world the, the value that nature brings, the, the fact that nature can't just simply be something, uh, an afterthought or a, a peripheral uh, element of a city. It has to be central and it has to be, we'd like to say, the key organizing idea behind that, the planning and design of that city, of that place. So we started um, this Bioflex Cities project at UVA in around 2011. I mentioned the Summit Foundation grant. We had uh, 10 partner cities around the world and, and we were trying to understand what, what the creative things were that those cities were doing. Um, at the end of that two years, we brought um, those cities, representatives from those cities to Charlottesville for a four day conference. We weren't planning to do this, but at the end of that four days, almost spontaneously, we all decided we needed to continue, that there was, um, this, this was an important work, important mission, and there was already a, a, a community and a spree de corps among the group. So we launched this Biophilic Cities Network. Um, and today we have um, 22 cities in the network, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, what a number of those cities are doing, but we also have uh, several thousand individual members of the network and probably several hundred uh, organizations. This slide, by the way, is just, um, just a little bit of little um, snippets of, of some of the good press that we've been getting about the idea, the vision of biophilic cities and, uh, and the network, so stories in places like Grist and, and Fast Company. So the biophilic design movement, I, I have to give a lot of credit to my architectural friends who um, have em embraced this idea in the designing of buildings. And I wanted to start just by showing a few examples of biophilic design at that building scale. This one is a couple of images uh, of the Credit Valley Hospital. We've gotten to know Ty, Ty Farrow, um, Toronto-based architect. And, wonderful story of this uh, cancer center and he, the process he went through in consulting patients and families about what they would like to see in the design. And they kept telling him, well, we want to see something that will give us hope. And uh, well, what will give you hope, he asked them. And they would say, well, aliveness. Um, aliveness will give us hope. And so he designed this, this living nature in, in this building, but a lot of it is in, in, in the form of shapes and forms and in this dramatic um, space as you come into the hospital, which is essentially a, um, a cross laminated timber uh, forest um, and, and feels as though you're entering uh, a forest. So um, natural materials like wood, this is another example that we've gotten to know quite well, the Phipps Conservatory um, in Pittsburgh, and specifically the Center for Sustainable Landscapes. It's a one of the first living, certified living buildings. Um, and it incorporates all of this natural daylight, operable, op openable windows, views of nature, wonderful green roof, sights and sounds of the natural world uh, permeate this, this building. So um, this is really wonderful work. Um, and um, I have to, you have to give a lot of credit to people like Stephen Kellert, um, who really in many ways got this idea of biophilic design, mainstreamed this idea. Um, this is actually his uh, six categories of biophilic design elements and attributes. And I, I won't go through all of this. Um, and this is a kind of modified illustration from uh, Amanda Sturgeon's uh, new book, Creating Biophilic Buildings, which I highly recommend. And here just highlighted a few things. I think it's maybe the obvious things that you would think that need to go into designing buildings. It's environmental features is one category. Color, water, air, natural ventilation, living things, plants and animals, but also natural shapes and forms and natural processes and patterns like the fractals that I mentioned in, in the beginning. 
it's, it's also filtered and diffused light and, and lights and shadows and, and thermal delight. Uh, it's also connecting to place, that fifth category, spirit of place, avoiding placelessness, um, uh, connecting to those special qualities of, of place that make them feel different and special and, and, and not like every other place. Uh, and then finally, evolved human nature relationships, things like prospect and refuge and, and connections to awe. Prospect and refuge are uh, really two kind of principles of the idea that we have evolved to really uh, prefer wide open uh, views, expansive panoramic views, that prospect, uh, something that delivered evolutionary uh, benefit to us, uh, and then refuge, um, seeking the safety and comfort of uh, a security of a space, being able to sit um, in a room where we can see out, but yet uh, feel feel safe and, and comfortable and and, uh, and and a feeling of refuge. So um, these are just a few of the biophilic design principles that we see uh, manifest in, in many um, contemporary buildings today. This is my last example, I think, at the building scale. And, and we will say, we, we say that a, a biophilic city is, is a, a city that, uh, where hopefully every building could be biophilic, but it's more than that. I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. This is an interesting case. We've gotten to know Brian Brisbane, another, actually another Toronto architect, and uh, he's designed this wonderful project, Designers Walk. It's a, a vertical forested tower, and he was inspired by uh, Bosco Verticale in Milan, the two, um, uh, two vertical residential towers there, and actually went and lived there for a while. Um, and he thinks this is an improvement on, on, on that uh, project. And it re is really interesting because it includes a couple of hundred trees, and he's designed the building in a way that the trees grow from the floor plates and the plug and play tree uh, system. It's quite interesting, but, but uh, probably most interesting is the process that the, the project went through to get approval. And it's uh, been now approved by the, the it's gotten the, the permits and the approval from the planning office in Toronto and, and should be breaking ground soon. But Brian tells the story of how um, the neighborhood, when they were getting a little bit of pushback from the city, it was the neighbor, the neighbors around this tower that came to its defense and actually pushed for its approval. And they saw it and see it as a positive addition to their neighborhood, a kind of a forested hill town uh, in a way. So the re future residents of this forested tower will benefit from um, these trees and the wonderful biophilic design elements that manifest them, you know, in the interior spaces. But it also becomes an asset for uh, for the community, and that's kind of unusual to hear stories like that. But again, it's about this connection to nature. So, so we believe that a biophilic city is a city full of biophilic. Uh, buildings, but it's more than that. It's the spaces between and beyond the buildings, and it's parks and gardens and trees and nature and birds of all kinds, outdoor nature, um, rivers and, and topography. It's all these things that are meaningful to us. And it's, um, these are cities that that's actively seek to connect us to that, to that nature. And increasingly, we recognize that cities have to play an important role in, in conservation of biodiversity as we see the, the threats, the decline of biodiversity globally. Cities are going to have to come to the fore, rise to the, to the fore, and, and, and we're seeing that, that um, uh, cities can, can, uh, can foster biodiversity and create spaces um, that harbor other forms of life. Um, so there's a conservation element to this as well. There's a coexistence uh, element to this, a, really an ethical uh, aspect of what a biophilic city is, this notion that we share space um, in a city with many other forms of life. And, and during this um, pan pandemic lockdown and stay at home, it's been interesting, of course, to see um, how uh, um, spaces are being taken over in some ways um, by uh, animals that um, they were there. Um, and but and, and there's a, a lot of life and a lot of biodiversity in cities 
um, I think we're paying more attention. We're seeing it more be because we because of this current circumstance. I was on a a uh, podcast a podcast recently where the the hosts asked me, well, you know, they were they're based in New York, and one of them said, well, I'm 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 hearing uh, birds. Um, it, are there more birds than there used to be? And unfortunately, there aren't more birds, and they are. Uh, stressed and, and many species um, in, in decline uh, globally, um, but what's happened is um, we're paying more attention. That's part of it. Uh, the, the normal sounds of, of car traffic and, and other urban sounds that would mask those natural sounds um, are, you know, diminished now and we're hearing things maybe in a way that we haven't been able to hear them uh, in the past, and that's very, very positive. So the vision of a biophilic city, again, is, is a, a nature-rich city, um, a city that puts nature at the center of its design uh, and planning. And this is an image from, from Singapore, a, a Woha design project that's become a bit famous now, Park Royal uh, Hotel. And Singapore has been one of our original partner cities, and they have really uh, been pushing this vision of a city and a garden. So we frequently describe the vision of a biophilic city as one of immersive nature, right? So we don't just want little bits of nature. We want you to, to live in an urban environment where you're surrounded by nature. And you hear that, those bird song, that bird song, for example. And, and increasingly our cities in our network are embracing this idea. So in Singapore, um, their motto has been for many years, Singapore a garden city. But they have now officially changed it to si Singapore a city and a garden. And so that seems like a minor change, but it's really quite profound. Um, so the idea that we, we don't just have a city where we have some places of nature, we have some parks that you have to go to, to visit. You've got to go to the nature. Why don't we reimagine cities as parks? Why don't we reimagine cities as gardens, as forests? And that's increasingly what this a vision is about. So this image, uh, this building, uh, is emblematic actually of the, of the number of things that the city, city state of Singapore has done uh, to advance this idea of immersive nature, uh, including something called the landscape replacement policy. So when you build a building like this, uh, you will be required to at least replace the nature lost by the footprint of the building, the ground level nature, with an equal or greater amount of nature in the vertical realm. And so in the case of Park Royal, uh, it's more than double um, the nature that was taken by the footprint of the building. So that nature is in the form of, of sky gardens and green roofs and uh, beautiful sort of flowing nature that you see uh, here. Um, and so Singapore has become a bit of a, an experiment, a bit of a positive story when it comes to that vertical, nature in the vertical realm, if you will. Um, it's a multi-scale, so this idea that uh, it's a whole of city uh, uh, approach, it's not just a biophilic building again, it's the interior spaces of that building, it's the room or the rooftop all the way out to the region or the bioregion and all of the spaces, spaces in between. This is an, an, an image uh, from Helsinki. Um, where it's possible to move uh, from the very dense uh, center of town all the way out to old growth forests at the edge of the city. So, so this um, multi-scaled whole of city uh, approach and ideally interconnected. So um, that's a little bit about what a biophilic city is. Um, it's again building neighborhood city. I like to show this slide partly because we are moving between these different scales. So we are interested in the codes that you might adopt at a city level that then influence the way a building is designed or a neighborhood is designed. Um, many things, innovations at a, a neighborhood or block level that 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 hopefully. Um, cumulatively add up to a more biophilic city. So we're sort of skirting or skating between these different, um, these different scales. The neighborhood scale seems to be an especially potent place for applying biophilic um, ideas. So this is an agenda again that spans indoor to outdoor. Um, it, we often talk about it, a biophilic city as a, as a complex matrix of urban nature, interconnected nature. Increasingly, we want to, to we want to see that those those 
buildings or, or individual parks or green features um, actually add up to, to are connected and cumulatively, cumulatively add up to a kind of more holistic system, an ecosystem. Um, and we see in many of our cities that that's, that's happened. By the way, that was a, an image of the ravine system in Toronto. Where is nature? Again, our notion of a biophilic city suggests that nature is really all, all around us, right? Again, it's not that national park that you visit once uh, on a holiday. It, it has to be that nature that we see all, all around us. So Pittsburgh has joined the network here. Just a, a few of the ways that they're thinking of themselves as biophilic. It's um, you know a, a pretty impressive 42% tree canopy cover. It's the, the increasingly important connections to the water, the rivers uh, there. It's um, a, a brand new 600-acre uh, park. It's installation of new uh, habitat um, for uh, birds. It's all, all those things, even a, even a water trail on, 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 on the rivers. Um, so we started in 2013, this, this Biophilic Cities Network, and I want to just say a couple of words. Uh, we have 22 cities, those cities have, a jo have joined the network uh, as partner cities, and that requires them to go through a process of, apply of, of applying. They have to develop a narrative about the ways in which they're already uh, biophilic or natureful. Um, they have to look, at, they have to um, uh, adopt um, um, metrics for, for, and, and targets for the future. Um, they, there is a requirement for a city council adopted resolution or pro proclamation um, saying that they plan to join the network and, and aspire to becoming a, a biophilic city. We often get good press. Um, Birmingham in the UK uh, on the left, uh, Guardian Story announcing they're joining the network and Pittsburgh on, on the right. Um, usually I show up um, and there is um, one or more celebratory events um, and here I'm giving the membership certificate, the partner city certificate to Mayor Peduto, uh, who is the mayor of, of Pittsburgh, and we're doing it in the Pitts uh, Conservatory there. So this is the current map. It uh, doesn't have a, a few of the newest cities on it, um, in, including a couple of new Virginia cities, uh, including Richmond and Arlington uh, County, um, in addition to Reston and, and Norfolk. So, we are growing this network. It's gaining traction. Uh, we, we're hopeful that uh, we, there are a number of cities that are, um, are going to be joining soon and that it will uh, continue to the scope and scale and, and, and reach will continue um, to, to enlarge and in particular um, uh, um, other parts of, of the world. It is remarkable um, the diversity, the innovations that these cities are developing or have developed the various ways they're incorporating nature into their design um, and planning. And uh, before I forget to say it, we have a web page, biophiliccities.org, and there uh, should be a page for each of the partner cities if, you, if you'd like more information on any of these cities. It's, but I, I do want to just quickly, in the time that I have left, give you a quick survey of what some of these cities are doing. Um, Back to Singapore, a uh, really remarkable story of its network of trails and pathways. Um, the, these park connectors, more than 300 kilometers um, long, some of them involve taking you through canopy level, tree treetop level uh, forest, um, but uh, a, a wonderful system for connecting where people live to larger green spaces in the in the city. Um, Milwaukee is a partner city, wonderful story of Alice's Garden. They've been innovating really in, in the reuse of land. Um, this is a wonderful community garden, uh, but it's also, uh, it's growing food that gets sold. It's, it's generating income and jobs, um, and it's teaching the next generation of urban farmers, but it's also green spaces for, for this neighborhood. Here's Phoenix Williams, the, the founder and director of that. that. San Francisco has been one of our, our partner cities uh, from the beginning as well. Uh, we know about parklets. They have kind of been uh, an epicenter of innovation when it comes to creating new uh, spaces in the city and, and inserting, finding creative ways to insert nature. So this is a program called Street Parks, 
Uh, they have more than 200. These are uh, median strips, mostly uh, leftover spaces. Um, the public works department in that city owns them and, and you as a neighborhood can take them over if you're willing to uh, steward them and, and design these spaces. Really wonderful uh, stories in each case. Our friend Jane Martin uh, started a movement for uh, sidewalk gardens in, in the city that led to actually the creation of a new uh, sidewalk landscape permit. It was before very difficult actually to get permission from the city to take up pavement and to insert sidewalk gardens. And now there are more than 2,000 of these sidewalk gardens that have been, uh, permits have been issued. Uh, Fremantle, um, our only participating Australian city at the moment, wonderful story, similar story of how they are uh, fostering greening and, and, and planting and, and the spaces around the city. The verges, they have a green verges. These are the spaces between the roadway and sidewalk and they're, they can be quite expansive and they have a, a program for subsidizing and assisting uh, in the replanting of these verges with native, native plants actually from a um, really interesting seed um, um, bank in that, in that city as well. Richmond, Virginia, I mentioned here, the wonderful story of reconnecting to uh, the James River and, and uh, a 600 acres of um, James River Park system land, including Belle Isle. Uh, here's Nathan Burrell, who, who um, used to run the, the um, James uh, River Park uh, system. Um, this is a relatively new, um, Richmond's relatively new to the network, but the Mayor Stoney there has been, has already uh, laid out some pretty impressive uh, goals for the city, including taking a hard look at the distribution of nature and finding public land um, that can help address the, the deficiency of parks in, in certain parts of the city, certain neighborhoods. Victoria Gastel is the capital of the Basque country in Spain, um, also a partner city from the beginning. Wonderful story of their green ring that circles this very walkable, compact, um, beautiful city. The latest chapter is they're bringing the green ring in, inside the city, the interior green ring. And one of the first projects was um, this daylit stream that runs right through um, the city. It's also become a major uh, bicycle and pedestrian corridor, uh, but a really wonderful green uh, element in the city. Um, back to Australia, Perth has not quite joined the network. We're hopeful they will soon, but a wonderful story of how you take a very sterile uh, typical downtown water feature, you see it on the upper right hand corner, very um, chlorinated, energy intensive, uh, ecologically sterile, and you convert it to this, what you see below this uh, amazing, wonderful, biodiverse um, wetland, uh, complete with um, mosquito eating fish even. Um, we have, by the way, made a number of, of short films about many of these projects. And this is actually one example. So if you want to know more about this the story of this urban wetland, there's a about an eight minute film on our film page on the biofolkcities.org page. So, okay. Um, Heartland, Oregon, wonderful, uh, also a kind of water story or stormwater uh, story. Um, this city has uh, installed more than 2,000 uh, what they call green streets. These are essentially segments of roadway um, that have been converted to linear uh, rain gardens or bioswales. And so wonderful a story of retaining, of, of, of addressing the stormwater problem, but also introducing new nature into, into these neighborhoods. And they're quite, quite beautiful, quite lovely. Portland has been one of our partner cities from the beginning as well. Um, another really big element of what it means to be a biophilic city is to confront that, that equity issue that we, we know that there is unfair, unjust a distribution of, of nature uh, across a city. And it is those neighborhoods of color, those um, less affluent neighborhoods that are going to have lower tree canopy cover, less access to, to parks. So part of the vision of a biophilic city is just biophilia, just an inclusive nature. And um, many of our cities are tackling that in very creative ways. And this is another a story, another example from Portland, um, the Collie Park and the Collie neighborhood and, uh, um, 
a neighborhood of color that didn't have um, a significant park. And so a wonderful story of engaging the, the residents in, in the actual design of this, of this park. And so, for example, the, the raised bed gardens uh, were all designed by elementary students uh, in a local school, um, residents of the neighborhood. So social equity, social justice is a key part of this as well. Um, Reston, Virginia, I mentioned, has been a partner city also. Um, we see a Biofluke City as not just a city that is nature rich. It's not just the presence or absence of nature. It's how engaged are residents in that nature? Um, are they outside? Are they, are they able to identify native species of flora and fauna? Are they engaged in, in, in volunteering and helping to restore nature? And so this is actually something that Reston has excelled in. And more than 50% of the residents of this um, city um, have engaged nature in one way or another over the course of a year. And, and they're doing that in some interesting ways, including what you see here, the Rest and Biophilic Pledge, which is something that they have been handing out essentially to all citizens and asking them to, to choose one or two or three things that they can do uh, to make their city more natureful and to connect them, get a, a, a connection to the natural world. Edmonton, Canada, I mentioned, has also been a partner city. Uh, one of their efforts has been to um, get more people outside. That may be difficult to do right now. It is, of course. But um, we do think that um, the, one of the challenges of being of, of, of um, a biophilic city is to, is to entice us outside. We spend already 90% of our, our day in, inside, in, indoors. Um, and we need to bring nature inside, but we also need to, to, to um, propel us out, outside if, if we can. Edmonton has done it in a really interesting way. Half the year is very wintry there, so that's the time when more people are staying inside. So they've actually developed a winter strategy, including a set of winter design standards um, to make it more enjoyable. Where would you need a windbreak? Where, where do you need warming stations? Um, even the idea, many cities have uh, freeways, Edmonton has freezeways, the idea of creating um, uh, ways that you can skate to work from your home. So, uh, and this uh, wonderful ice castle on the upper right, um, another reason to, to get out in the wintertime to see that. Edmonton is uh, another great example of a city that has been thinking of other forms of life. They have adopted uh, a kind of ecological network approach to all their planning. Um, and so if you build anything in that city or you, you install any kind of infrastructure, it has to take into account the movement of wildlife. And so uh, they've um, built um, many wildlife passages, actually been an innovator in that, in that area. Um, and I think more than 27 now, um, and it's now um, written into their, to their engineering codes. Uh, so these are just becoming standard things that you do, this idea of a, an ecologically connected city, and judging the, the success of our planning by how easy it might be for uh, birds or even a coyote to move through uh, your city. Um, another an interesting city in our network is Cur de Bat, um, a small city in Costa Rica. And I put in a slide um, in this presentation in part because they just last week got a wonderful story you see on the left uh, in The Guardian. Um, and it's uh, really lovely the way the, the mayor, we've gotten to know the city pretty well, and they have been implementing something they call Sweet City, which is all about um, pollinators and focusing their energy around around uh, planting things for for bees and butterflies and, and birds and making the city a friendly place. The mayor talks about this as giving citizenship to bees, plants, and and trees. And they have created um, a number of bio corridors. So I, I did again, like Edmonton, allowing species to move easily through through this city. Another example is Singapore. Some of you know uh, about the smooth-coated otters there. There are now about 80 of them, uh, and that's a, a real success story um, and a real coexistent success story. This is Lena Chan on the left of In Parks National Parks Board, who's been our main collaborator in, in Singapore. So 
um, 80, 80 um, um, smooth coated, coated otters in about 10 distinct groups. Um, residents are looking for them. Visitors want to see them. Um, it's been a kind of a wonderful addition to urban life. And it's a, an element of wildness, really. And that's often how we're describing this um, in, our, in our network, that we, we want spaces and places. We want to be living in cities where we might get a glimpse of uh, something like a smooth-coated um, otter. For me, um, a lot of this has to do with birds. I mentioned birds already a couple of times. I've just finished a book about birds and cities. Uh, that's coming out in the fall and um, that tells stories from a number of our partner cities. These are images from actually uh, Portland and um, really interesting. We actually made a film uh, about what's happening on the left. These are Vox's Swiss. These are migratory Swiss and they come through Portland during September. And um, this is the Chapman Elementary School uh, chimney. And they come at the end of the day, they sort of spoil around in mass and fall into this chimney in a really spectacular, dramatic way. About 6,000, 7,000 of them here. And um, hundreds of people come out to watch it. It's um, a moment of awe, a spectacle that makes um, really important and very special um, for other reasons. And um, so this is actually not the broadcast quality from this is just my eyes. Um, uh, taking a little video of this, but just to give you a little sense of it, you can hear the, the sounds of the crowd. And at a certain point, uh, a Cooper's hawk flies up and sits on the top of the chimney. You hear it now, it's kind of We're um, hearing for the Cooper's hawk as well, but the crowd, and then the Cooper's, you see the Cooper's hawk, um, and eventually it flies away, and the crowd starts to fly. Uh, anyway, it's a remarkable, um, wondrous thing, and it's one of the many examples of the ways we can be designing um, nature in, and, and, and we can be thinking about how um, birds are affected by urban environments. This is another example from this forthcoming book, the Wal Waltham Style Wetlands, uh, former waterworks um, in London which has become a major urban birding uh, location. And this wonderful story of the tower to the engine house, um, it's a replica of what was there before. And it incorporates uh, 54 um, spots for nesting a uh, common Swiss. And so we need to be designing everything to accommodate birds and, and certainly designing uh, our facades to minimize the, the fatal strike of birds. And that's, we, we know, a huge problem by one estimate is as much as a billion birds a year are killed um, from striking glass. Um, and wonderful stories now of cities like San Francisco, first American city to adopt mandatory bird-friendly design standards, basically fritted bird-friendly glass. Um, and uh, this is actually the uh, Javits Center in New York. New York is uh, the most recent a city to have adopted this uh, minimum bird safe standards and the Javits Center was certainly um, a big uh, part of the selling point uh, for that. So this is a, a building convention center that went, went through a retrofit, replaced all of its glass with bird, bird safe, bird friendly fritted glass and as a result a 90% reduction in bird uh, mortality. Uh, there's also a green roof on the top which is uh, serving as nesting habitat for birds. Um, by the way, that retrofit also did a lot to reduce the energy consumption of the building. Here's the, here's the book cover for the forthcoming book, Bird Friendly City, a little bit of a plug, advanced plug for that, for that book. Um, one of the story um, in my slides from that book is from Phoenix, another partner city, where they have been gradually uh, installing artificial uh, burrows to support relocated burrowing owls. Uh, right in the middle of the city. And, and we have another five, seven minute film uh, about this if, if you're interested. But um, biophilic cities maximize moments of awe. That's a, another aspect of what a biophilic city is. I've already kind of said this, but we want to live in, in places where what we see um, is magical, delightful, uh, awe-inducing. Awe and this idea of judging the success of a city or even a building 
um, and, and by the awe, the moments of awe, a city that maximizes the moments of awe, so de designing the city, um, the city of awe. Um, for me, that's often around birds, um, but it will be many different kinds of things. This, this is actually, I love the, the uh, image and um, the student in the middle. This is actually a group of my Planning 101 students going on one of our bird, bird walks. Um, awe is something, just to take a little bit of a diversion, um, Rich Lube in his wonderful new book, Our Wild Calling, talks about awe as something unexpected that stimulates a sense of vastness and possibility. Um, and it goes by lots of different names and wonder and wildness, magic. Um, it's also about stimulating empathy and compassion. And we know from the evidence, actually, that uh, when we are in, in, in these awe induced or awe-inspired um, experiences, we, we feel more generous, we're, we're more kind, we're more likely to uh, engage in so-called pro-social behavior. Um, in New York, one of the wonderful awe-inspiring stories is the return of whales. And again, we have a, about a nine-minute uh, short film, nine-minute film about Gotham Whale on our webpage. Gotham Whale is a nonprofit uh, started actually to to raise awareness about the whales um, and new wit, and they're actually whale watching tours now. And there's a citizen science initiative around the whales, whales and dolphins uh, also. Um, and it, it's just a wonderful story that as you might be riding on a ferry, you, you might get a glimpse of a humpback whale. And, it, and it's a wonderful story sort of from a planning and policy point of view. Why are the whales coming back? Well, it's cleaner water, it's the return of the menhaden. It's an a, 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 a increasingly important element of what makes New York City a magical place. And um, a lot of our cities are incorporating marine nature. And this quickly, I'm, I'm gone past my, my um, targeted time. So I'm going to just quickly go through the last few slides and, and we'll have a chance to talk about some of this. Uh, Wellington, New Zealand has been a, a partner city from the beginning. They have an elaborate uh, uh, set of green belts on land. Um, but they're also increasingly incorporating the marine environments around them. And now they're, they are working on a blue belt uh, strategy. And they have a lower right image here of a wonderful marine park, just a few minutes bicycle ride from the center of town. And you see images from a marine education center. Every child that goes through the Wellington school system visits the center and learns about marine nature. Norfolk is uh, one of our newest uh, um, cities thinking about, uh, about resilience. They have prepared a very impressive strategy called Vision 2100 and a resilience code, a resilience-based zoning code that's mandating a, a, a resilience quotient for all new development, all new projects in that city, a wonderful story. Resilient and biophilic. So many of the things that you do uh, to meet the resilience code are things like green roofs, things that would bring more nature into your city. So now the last few slides are just, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the things we're doing in the network. As you can tell, a lot of this is about um, collecting and sharing stories about the cities helping each other. It's about um, um, collecting, analyzing, and sharing best practices. Here are two examples from San Francisco. Uh, on the right, there are better roofs ordinance, the first American city to mandate the installation of green roofs, and the first American city to, to require bird safe uh, building design on, on the left. Um, we, we write articles and, and the individuals and cities in our network write, write articles as well. A lot of that appears in our online journal called Biophilic Cities. That's, you can also find that on biophiliccities.org. Please take a look, wonderfully rich uh, articles and um, that, uh, a lot of wonderful and innovative practice going on around the world. I've already mentioned the the films and filmmaking, and this is an image from uh, an early film we made about Singapore. Um, this is uh, uh, on our website as well. It's gotten 100,000 um, views on YouTube, which um, isn't a lot these days probably, but it is remarkable that you can uh, collect these stories and share them um, with relatively a little amount of money going into these films. They're very low budget, but they are quite powerful, uh, in fact. Um, this is another example of filmmaking. We often work with a local film crew. This is the film made for 
uh, partner city Ed Edmonton. Uh, that's also on our, our web page. Um, we don't have a film yet about Richmond, but we participated in, in January uh, in their environmental film festival. It was also a chance to give the uh, membership certificate to um, folks from the mayor's office. And we showed, we screened a, a three short uh, films in that film festival. Um, increasingly, we're doing things like this. This is a neighborhood design workshop, by for design workshop that we uh, helped to run uh, for the city of Pittsburgh that happened in February, which seems like about a year ago, but it's just a couple of months ago. Uh, the cities are doing many things uh, together. Um, they're engaged in, they're developing re long-term relationships and, and um, memoranda of understanding to work together on things. This is an image from San Francisco. Uh, we have city to city exchanges within the network. So this image is of a, a delegation from Singapore visiting San Francisco to learn about bird friendly design uh, actually. Uh, we organize a number of events. Um, for the last four or five years, we have organized a biophilic, le biophilic leadership summit at the very biophilic community of Serenby, just outside Atlanta. We had to cancel it, unfortunately, this year, but hopefully it'll happen again uh, next year. And then um, one last thing, we have, um, we're going to soon be launching what we're calling a sort of global uh, pattern uh, book. Um, global um, database of biophilic city patterns inspired by Chris Alexander and this idea of pattern language. And, and you see just some examples here on the screen, but this will be a, a kind of crowdsourced, uh, partner city sourced, uh, but curated uh, database of patterns as a way to share, um, share innovation, but it also as a way just to inspire, to be able to see all of the unique and special ways that we're incorporating nature um, into urban design and planning. This is my last slide, um, and then I'll stop. It's, we've got books um, and full-length movies like The Nature of Cities. This is, um, you can find all of this online. Um, this is our newest book, Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design, an island dress book from 2018, and it's just been, um, just gotten a Chinese translation. So. With that, I will stop, and sorry I've gone a little bit long. Um, do please visit the network, biophilicities.org. Um, okay, Kim, I, I was yeah. uh, sorry to be so long-winded. No, thank you so much, Tim. Um, and so we will, people should put their questions into the Q&A and we will, um, we will go through some of them here. Okay. So there, was a question here from uh, jo Jody Lahendro says, can nature be commercialized, controlled, limited to the point where it is no longer nature? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the crux of this notion of wildness, right? That we, we want that wild nature close, close by and, and ha having birds around us for example, or smooth-coated otters um, is a is wild nature. It's obviously happening in a in an urban setting, and we have to to, to manage those relationships, and we have to do things um, to successfully coexist. So, um, does that take away from that naturalness or that wildness of of nature? I don't know. Um, we increasingly we have a lot of blended forms of of nature and technology. I, I haven't really had a chance to talk about uh, biophilic art. Um, there's a, a, there are lots of examples now of sort of blending um, a, a, a green wall, for example, that is a is a has a part of it is a painted canvas and part of it is is living nature. Or the super trees in, in Singapore would be another example. These large uh, metal trees, oversized trees in the shape of a tree, eliciting the, a, 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 certainly a natural connection there, uh, but with thousands of living uh, plants attached to that metal tree. Is that nature? Um, it's certainly a kind of nature. So, so that's part of the open question here is what, what constitutes nature? And and what constitutes wildness? So it's a really good question. I'm not sure I have a great answer, but. Yeah. Um, 
So shifting gears just a little bit, I think there's a couple of folks who have asked a similar question about, are there great examples of historic buildings adapted to biophilic design? And are there ways to retrofit current buildings or even cities to be more biophilic? Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, yes. Um, rarely do we have the chance to create an entirely new city, right? So it's, it's very much a, a, a process of retrofitting. It's about conserving, protecting the nature that's already there, the rim net nature, but it's about uh, repurposing. So um, I gave a few examples of that, but cities like Milwaukee, where there are a number of vacant lots, um, that is a work in progress. It's a it's taking those lots um, and putting them together, actually creating uh, pocket parks and um, planting native uh, plants and trees and orchards. And it's definitely um, a, a new layers of nature onto an existing city. And the same is certainly true at a building scale. Um, we have a number of examples of buildings that have been retrofitted uh, to incorporate more na more natural elements. I mentioned the Javits Center, uh, that that green roof is a is a ret retrofit. It's not a, you know, not an example of an especially old building, but it's certainly, uh, ev every building has that, that op opportunity um, for, for doing something new, whether it's a, a, a designed a green feature like a green wall or a, a green roof, or it's uh, repurposing spaces around the city for trees or gardens or um, enhanced wildlife habitat, bird habitat, ways that we can retrofit buildings. Actually, I'll give you a couple of examples of retrofitting like that London example of bird, you know, uh, incorporating uh, new roosting spaces in that, in that structure. So it's definitely something we can do. And to add on that, what do you think, if you have an idea of the additional costs to build biophilic aspects into current urban development, 10%, 20%? And do we feel like the current situation, like is it um, something that might have an impact in this economic situation? Well, I think that the, the basic thing to say and the basic argument that we would make is that there is probably no better uh, investment. If you're just looking, just uh, only based on financial return, um, nothing is going to return in the way that investments in nature will, whether that's uh, enhancing, expanding your tree canopy cover all of the way, all of the, the uh, cooling and evapotranspiration benefits that trees provide more than pay for themselves multiple, you know, times. Um, and and, and at, the, at a building scale, you know, you can talk about a 1% um, a or 2% or whatever, the, there will be an additional a cost connected with biophilic design features often, but they are almost immediately paid for the you know, paid for. I mean, the the um, return on investment is is uh, very quick, if not immediate. So these are all things that we should be doing. You know, that can be justified based on the economic benefits and economic value. Nevertheless, uh, this larger set of ethical concerns that I would. I would bring. And what do we owe nature? What are what duty of care? Uh, what is it about a city that that engages its population in in nature? The meaning, the purpose, the deeper uh, value created. Um, you know the kinds of places that that uh, we really want to want to be living. Right? These are these are places where we're in close contact with nature, and we find that that the nature enhances the connection with other human beings. Right? The, there's that social dimension. Um, we can try to put dollar values on those things, and that's been done. Um, uh, Bill Browning at um, uh, Terrapin Bright Green uh, has done this report on the economics of biophilia. And you, when you start adding up for a city like New York, uh, what are the what are the economic benefits uh, of, of having a, re a reduced crime uh, in, in parks and, and as a result of tree planting, for example, in neighborhoods? Uh, what about the benefits um, from you know kids getting higher test scores and and teachers being happier and you, you start adding it up and it's billions of dollars uh, so it this 
this agenda makes a lot of sense from an economic point of view. Fantastic. And um, I'm not really, so, <laughs> I'm kind of spinning, but you're, you're Yeah, good. no, I have. <laughs> um, so diving a little bit into some of the, your different partner cities, mm -hmm. um, have you seen m more examples of, sorry, where did that question go? Um, examples of park or neighborhood scale landscape projects that have particularly impressed you from really hot, dry climate cities um, where it might not have as much greenery? Um, yeah. They said beyond the, the borough owl example. Yeah, yeah. So we, you know, every, I didn't say this and I, should have, I usually do, but the, you know, each city, we have in this 22 cities and, and um, really the network overall, uh, it, we've got lots of different climates, right? And lots of different kinds of nature and uh, what works in New York is not going to work in Phoenix. And there's a small subset of uh, cities, arid cities in our, in our network and Phoenix is the, probably the best example um, and th they have done some wonderful things. I have to give them credit. You know, Phoenix is often um, often receives a lot of a lot of a lot of negative commentary, and it's not the most sustainable city in the world. That's for sure. But it's done a pretty good job actually shifting a lot of the landscape planting away from non-native turf grass, water g water dependent. Uh, kind of landscaping to, to xeriscaping and, and native desert um, landscaping. And that's happened in, you know, little, little medium and big um, uh, projects. And uh, the percentage of um, landscaping around homes, the percentage has shifted dramatically in the direction of native and, and xeriscaping. Um, a, a one example of a really big project is the, the the Phoenix Airport um, has taken out all essentially all of their kind of turf grass landscaping and installed instead um, local or you know, native species and very low water uh, requiring makes a lot of sense from a water and an energy point of view and that's a wonderful story um, actually and aesthetically um, it's really beautiful nature it's a different you know kind of aesthetic um, but it's something that helps to foster that sense of place, that connection to, to the, the nature, you know, where, we, where we're living. Yeah, and then on the flip side, then do coastal cities have special considerations in committing to biophilia as they are yes. increasingly inundated due to this rising sea level? Yes, they, they do. And there's a whole other uh, hat that I wear sometimes or, or subjects that I talk about um, frequently uh, labeling this bl blue urbanism, um, the we are the blue planet, right? Uh, three quarters of our planet is water. Um, we are, you know, increasingly the urbanized planet, but yet the blue and the urban uh, don't often come together, and that's a real challenge, a real and a real opportunity, uh, actually. So we do have some wonderful examples uh, of that and and uh, we have a little film about the billion uh, billion oyster project in New York and 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 a, a growing number of really remarkable stories about how coastal cities are reconnecting residents with those watery and marine environments um, but that's true though we also have the danger part of it so I sometimes talk about this as the danger and delight and it's balancing the danger and the delight and doing things like New York, um, the, the shift in the direction of, of uh, a softer edge, um, designing for a more dynamic uh, edge that responds to sea level rise, floodable shoreline parks. It is possible for us, and, and I gave the example of Norfolk, I didn't talk about that one image, which was a Kate Orff uh, design project actually, um, the resilient park. Uh, in Norfolk, and it's an example example of precisely that. So most of the time, that is a park that's available for the residents. It adds immensely to the quality of life of that that particular neighborhood. But it's also designed uh, with sea level rise in mind, um, and so it, it's possible to have both the the address both the danger and the delight 
in the design work that we that we do. We've had, by the way, have a another really cool film on the webpage um, about a, a project called Peer Into the Night, which is a um, where they set up a camera. They they actually send divers down and they send the images back to a peer in real time to a screen, basically, where there's a naturalist um, commenting on what they're seeing. And uh, so, you know, we've got we've to be more creative, I think, at building emotional connection to the marine world, which is just, you know, intrinsically harder to see and to feel and to, and to see and to connect with. And and so our cities are are doing some really creative ways to 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 uh, to foster those kind of connections. Um, we have a question from Ed Bryant that says, "I noticed that the shape of biophilic cities are in the form of linear natural greenways, which would seem to promote the movement of wildlife. Are there ways to measure the movements of wildlife?" And additionally, um, another alum asked, um, you know, what do we do about sort of nuisance wildlife too? So if we're bringing the good yeah. ones, do we also have the bad ones for yeah. public health and for, yeah. you know, the ones that are coming in that are detrimental? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a frequent question. Um, and, you know, one answer, my answer would be um, the nuisance, it's really a matter of, of coexistence. And we have some pretty tried and true uh, techniques now. So, um, I, you know, the idea of living with mountain lions as, as is the case in San Francisco and Los Angeles to some degree, and coyotes in almost every city. There is certainly an element of danger, um, but we know that um, if we don't feed them and we make sure that they continue to be fearful of humans, um, there's the Coyote Project that has a very specific set of, of coexistence ideas. Um, we can't. I mean, this is true for, for virtually every species. And for many species, like birds, it's more a case of just doing what we can to enhance, expand the habitat, and taking away, doing what we can to minimize the dangers. Um, for example, you know, bird strikes, particularly zero to 70 feet or, or so. Um, so it's not terribly difficult, I would say. It's a matter of education. It's also a matter of attitude. And, you know, I think tolerance is a big part of the, the ethos or the ethic of a biophilic city. I want to live in a city where I, I might catch a glimpse of something very wild uh, or hear something. Um, and and to, to have that means that we have to be tolerant. We have to be curious about that species, we have to be caring, we have to be empathetic, um, but we have to also develop uh, active um, methods for coexistence. Uh, the first part of your question was about, or that question was about um, uh, how do we know your parks and how do we know, um, I mean, we do our, our partner city, Edmonton. If you watch our, the Edmonton film, um, they've actually set up camera traps you know, motion activated infrared camera traps um, at the openings of many of their um, wildlife passages, their underpasses mostly. And you can see with your own eyes that, that um, quite an abundance, quite a diverse set of animals moving through uh, that city. Um, and there are organizations, um, Chicago, Chicago Wildlife Watch would be another great uh, example they have set up um, a series of transects through the city where they're using camera traps to monitor wildlife movement. And, uh, and it's pr pr giving a pretty robust sense of what's there. Um, again, we're, we're getting glimpses, we're seeing more of that wildlife now because we're kind of at home and we're, you know, we're inside. And, um, but it was there all along. Um, and it's adapting pretty well, and species like coyotes are doing are doing pretty well, actually. Um, and uh, we're finding, discovering that you know that things like they they've now learned to look both ways as they cross a, cross a road. Uh, so so there's a you know we, we are able to monitor to track it to to see to see it in real time. Yeah. Um. Thanks. And then, so we have several uh, questions that are about uh, the partner cities and policy change. So 
Have you seen partner cities proceed to make policy level changes, the framework plans, uh, yes. planned urban developments to allocate money? And then who usually pushes that within the town or state levels to invest mm -hmm. into these things? Like how yeah. does this whole chain work? Okay, um, yeah, that's a complicated question and, and a longer, a longish answer, but um, we, we see activity both uh, from the bottom up, meaning kind of grassroots and from advocacy organizations in a city um, that can be very effective. And in fact, in a few cases, uh, we've gotten, cities have actually been, in, been encouraged to join the network in part because of the work, the advocacy work of a, of a local group. So um, there's a group called Biophilic DC. Um, there's a group in Philadelphia called Biophilly that, that, that we've helped, helped along or helped to create. Um, and they're doing wonderful work and changing the, the discussion. And, and it, it does lead to, to tangible change. And that might be uh, more funding for urban forestry. It might be um, changing a design element on a, a proposed uh, building. On the other hand, uh, on the other side of it, we, we, there's a lot of policy and uh, a lot of work from, from the top, right? So, so we're finding our, our collaborators are often in a mayor's office. They are often sustainability directors uh, for local governments. And, uh, and yes, lots of examples, not that, not that we can um, you know, entirely take credit for any of a, an ordinance or a policy necessarily, but it's um, the, the biophilic principles are making their way in, into plans. So as, as one small example, Arlington County, um, one of our most recent um, new, new members to the, to the network, and there is a, um, a reference to, to biophilia and biophilic design in their new um, public spaces, um, public open spaces plan actually. So it is beginning to, to this idea, set of principles, ideas beginning to make their way into official plans. Um, and, and that could, you know, really make a difference moving forward. Um, I have a couple of questions. I know we have a lot of them, but I also want to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, so um, a little bit more about, but yeah, Good, good, good. Um, so wondering how you identify new potential cities for your network. Um, do you contact the mayor, do citizens petition in, yeah. and, um, and then, yeah, so start there. Okay, yeah, and, and I didn't, I forgot to say this. I usually say this several times, but um, if you are living in a city uh, where you think there might be interest in this, if you could help us, um, and we're frequently asking, making that that sort of request, um, and and it's important to say that there is there is no perfect city, right? And this is not a this is not a green certification system. We're not the U.S. Green Building Council. We're not going to declare that your city is biophilic. It's an aspirational network. Um, so all it takes is a city uh, interested in these ideas and willing to embrace them, willing to um, set some targets, willing to commit to, to moving in this direction. And so, um, so to answer the question, it's been a kind of mix of responding to inquiries and interest from, from cities. So query de bot, um, it just made a lot of sense for them. Uh, we, they knew about us before we knew about them, and they uh, kind of approached us, and it it worked that way. Um, in other cases, we we have uh, actively sought cities we think are doing really interesting things, and we'd like to have in, in the network. Um, Chengdu, China, for example, um, actually visited there, spent time with them. Um, what we're discovering is that we what we think is a, is a relatively straightforward application process or process for joining the network and participating ends up being not that straightforward 
from, from the local government's point of view. And so we find, we're finding that we're putting a lot of sort of, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of, there are lots of hours that go into sort of cultivating uh, relationships and um, educating and, and they're learning about us and we're learning about them. And, and so it, it takes, um, and some percolation of the idea, you know, just takes some time. So what um, we thought, you know, a city we thought might join in a month ends up, it ends up being a couple of years before it finally happens. What are some of the smallest cities in your network? Yeah, so uh, many of them are in sort of the 200, 300,000 population range. And that's kind of the sort of a sweet spot there in some ways in terms of what, what cities are able to do and kind of their level of innovation and, and engagement and with, with nature. So, so when you think about uh, Norfolk, uh, Richmond, Arlington are all kind of in that, that, um, that size uh, range. But then we have cities like Edmonton Edmonton's a million, um, and uh, but the smallest uh, cities, I think um, we have a couple of cities that are 60,000, um, and Reston, Reston is not an incorporated city, but they, they function like a city within Fairfax County, but they're 60,000 and they're part of the network. Um, so we have a couple of 60,000, but we also have, I think the smallest city may be, may be Fremantle, uh, which is partly a function of the way local government is structured in in uh, Australia. So they're only about 30,000. So that's the smallest city that we, I think, in terms of population. But um, Australia is a funny place because even cities like Melbourne, Melbourne and Sydney, um, those cities proper are, are actually quite small in population in a, in a much larger met metropolitan area. Uh. And then have you, uh, well, this will uh, bring it back home a little bit. Um, are there progressive things happening in Charlottesville along these lines that are inspiring you? Yes, well, it is my home. It is our home, many of us. Um, and <clears throat> I frequently get that question, well, why isn't Charlottesville in the network? And uh, is Charlottesville a biophilic city? And we've had some discussions and we're still, we're hopeful that they, they will be able to join it at some point. Yeah, I mean, it's a really wonderful, if you, if you think about tree canopy cover, for example, Charlottesville is pretty high. We're pretty natureful. Lots more work to be done. Um, where I live in the Greenbrier neighborhood, we have um, a wonderful, you know, Greenbrier Park and a, and a wonderful story of the, the, um, Meadow Creek uh, stream restoration, the place I go to frequently. Uh, so from a um, biodiversity enhancement, you know, kind of a wonderful story, wonderful things going on uh, here. Also some, you know, great things happening in, in Albemarle and the surrounding counties as well. So it's one thing that we're, you know, almost every place uh, has stories and, and experiences and, um, wonderful lessons to, to tell. And sometimes there are lessons about how something didn't work, um, but there's something interesting everywhere. And, and again, we don't think this is an optional agenda. It's absolutely essential. It's innate. It's, it's about human nature. It's so, it, it's something, we need to be doing this work wherever we are. Um, whether you're living in a suburb, a rural area, a central city, very dense, large city. Uh, the agenda will manifest in different ways, but they're, it's just as important. Um, and uh, so, but, but yeah, um, I, we're, we're quite proud of Charlottesville. Anyways. Yeah. And do you feel, um, are there ways, other ways besides bringing their city to you how many, how might alumni participate or collaborate in some way to support your decision? Sure. That's a great question. So, so yes, um, if you are in a city and you have some connections in that city and you would, would, would like to actively uh, nominate a city, um, that'd be great. But there are a lot of other ways you could be involved as well. Um, one way is just to go to the web page and you can join the network as an individual and you just sign a, a pledge and 
and give us your email and then you'll be getting all of the um, all the blogs and all the postings and and you'll hear about the films and you'll hear about the new uh, when a new issue of the Biopic Cities Journal comes out. So you, that, that would be one really easy way to be involved. And, and I think on that form, there is um, a, a chance to express interest in doing something else. You could, you, could or, you could write an article, you could organize a meeting, you could um, you know, um, do something in your neighborhood. Um, and so there's so many ways that you could be, be participating in this global movement more generally, but also being involved in the Biofixies network. So if you have any ideas, um, you know, it's really interesting in places like Pittsburgh, the Phipps Conservatory, one of the things they uh, did was to start a monthly biophilia meetup group, essentially. And, and that started with a few people and then, you know, grew and we'd love to see that in every city. Um, sometimes they, you know, they have discussions, they read books, they, they have film night. Um, and so anything that you could do to uh, start the discussion in your, your town or your city would be good. Um, we'd, we'd, and, and we would love to help you if, if, if possible. Great, well, I think, um, See. We still have a couple more questions, but I do want to wrap this up around 6.30, let people have dinner and whatnot. Do you, um, one thing I know a lot of folks had been asking me was, do you have more information for this that would be in a kid-friendly um, manner uh, that introduce it to younger folks, uh, this notion and books yeah. to read or access to information? Yeah, good question. I don't know. Um, we have had some relationships with, with schools. So there was a group of teachers in North Carolina that um, started working on a sort of a biophilic cities a curriculum, elementary school kind of level curriculum. Um, I'll have to explore that and see what we have, but I, I don't, you know, I think, I don't think we're doing enough. Um, and there is, by the way, this is a little off track, but there's a wonderful five minute film about a, an elementary school in Georgia, Chattahoochee Skill, uh, uh, Hills Charter School, which is all about um, how, how you organize the space, space, physical space, um, so that kids are outside moving around during the day with their boots ready to deal with whatever weather, going into the forest to do their to do their um, math assignments or whatever, science. Um, and there's a whole kind of um, movement for incorporating biophilic ideas in, into especially elementary schools. And, uh, and we, have, we have lots of examples of that. Um, but what I don't think we probably have yet is sort of biophilic cities, um, you know, a brochure or a set of materials that would um, maybe tell that story specifically or that idea specifically exposed, you know, younger kids to that idea. Um, I'll, have, I'll, I'll have to explore that, but that's a great question. Great. All right, well, I think we should probably wrap up. Tim, do you have any other last minute thoughts? Um, yes. I put the website up a couple of times yes. into the chat, so everyone should that's definitely great. click on that. Okay, wonderful. The only thing I would say is, I'm, I'm just quickly scanning. There are there's specific questions that you would like to to send me, pose to me. That would be that would be great. So it's Beatly. I don't know if my is my email there. It is, isn't it? Um, I've got all these boxes sort of in front of the words on that last slide. But Beatly at virginia.edu. Uh, there's also a contact button for me um, through the biofluxcities.org uh, page. And yeah, happy to start. Uh, conversations and, and happy to do what I can to answer questions in that way or you know provide information if I can but uh, we'd love to have you engaged in this and uh, really thank you all for taking the time to, to listen to this and um, yeah I'm, I'm very hopeful that this it's a it's an odd time obviously um, unsettling times um, but this is one thing that sort of gives me some hope 
Well, thank you so much, Tim. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, talk about this. And thank you everybody who joined. Um, it was really great to get your questions and we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks everybody. Thanks.